Welcome to Ask the Expert, featuring leading neurologist and muscle physiologist, Dr. Stephen Cannon. In this episode of Ask the Expert, we cover some of the more frequently asked questions of this video series. Remember, the content in this video is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician with any questions regarding a specific medical condition. So if I'm concerned about having periodic paralysis, what can I do to help my medical team arrive at an accurate diagnosis? This is an area where proactive measures by the individual can be very helpful. Things like start a diary, record accurately how frequently are your attacks occurring, how severe are those. Instead of just saying I was weak all over or I was tired, give examples of specific things you can or cannot do. I couldn't stand up by myself. I couldn't raise my um, arm to my face or I couldn't pick up a heavy suitcase. Another helpful thing is to uh, ask other members of your family and make a family tree and understand what other individuals are affected. It's also helpful uh, to take a video sample. So if during an episode, a family member can take a, a, a video of the difficulties you're having, um, that can be of uh, tremendous assistance at arriving at a diagnosis. The other thing to be aware of is where to turn, what options are out there. I would advocate that it's very important to be evaluated by a neurologist, and in particular, a neuromuscular specialist. So neurologists go on to subspecialty training in neuromuscular disease, and these are the experts who are best equipped to make the diagnosis. They've perhaps seen patients with periodic paralysis and have the equipment necessary to do the detailed electrical testing of muscle to arrive at a diagnosis. The management of this disorder is relatively simple. So once the diagnosis is established, then you can go back to your primary care doc and uh, receive all your follow-up locally. Um, but it's still worth the effort, perhaps even with travel, to go see a, a regional expert who can help establish this diagnosis because it'll change the whole outlook for how you try to manage this in your activities of daily living and optimize your level of performance. What happens most frequently is there's a, a, a concern I have periodic paralysis or I certainly have weakness that's severe enough that I'm gonna to go to my primary care doc and tell them about it. And the primary care doc is trying to help and uh, they're not getting any definitive answers. And the possibility of periodic paralysis comes up on the list. And many primary care docs say, you know, this is odd enough and strange enough. I've never seen it. I'm gonna make a referral to a neurologist. You should, you should get a full on uh, assessment. And statistically what happens is neurologists say, Yep, I know all about this, I've seen this. You know what, you don't have periodic paralysis. I hate to say this, but often the neurologist is the killjoy in this interaction, right? It's, the, it's, it's wow. uh, you, you know, that's a big part of neurological practice. I mean, uh, probably 60% of the patients that come to an outpatient practice is to say, no, don't worry, that numbness and tingling isn't a problem. No, that tremor is not Parkinson's disease. No, that fainting spell you had was not a seizure. No, no, no. And that's a lot of what neurologists do, actually. One way we might be able to get this message across is, my primary care doc had a normal blood result and the genetic test is negative. He said, I can't have periodic paralysis, I'm stuck. Because the answer is you could still have periodic paralysis. Because the, the, the GP doesn't, you know, you read these stories in the book, oh, it should be easy, we're just gonna measure potassium level. Oh, that can be ambivalent, we'll just do the gene test. But both of those could come back normal and you still have periodic paralysis, but this person is uncomfortable making a diagnosis of periodic paralysis. Rather than the PPA being expected to give you know, legally binding uh, and life-changing advice, it would be just to advocate the fact that the PPA is this fantastic public forum for exchanging ideas and you get the opportunity yeah. to talk to people who have periodic paralysis and you can get direct feedback, are my symptoms and, and experiences at home similar to what these other people who have the disease, what's that like? And you know, that's the value of the meetings, that's the value of the blogs and the you know, communication. Many individuals with periodic paralysis are frustrated because of the long journey it takes to get an accurate diagnosis that's filled along the way with many potholes of misdiagnoses, sometimes of which there has been unnecessary testing or medications administered uh, that can have real consequences. 
Um, this is unfortunately a common uh, experience in periodic paralysis. Many times uh, a, cl a well-meaning clinician will suspect this is a functional illness or related to uh, depression, prescribed um, antidepressants, which can have uh, many side effects uh, and will not be of value in uh, periodic paralysis per se. And so this is uh, one of the premiums for arriving at uh, the appropriate diagnosis in the shortest amount of time and why we wanna get the word out on who should be concerned about the possibility of periodic paralysis and where to go and what to ask to try to arrive at the correct diagnosis. One of the greatest concerns is that after several decades of uh, relatively normal function and recovering from these uh, episodes of weakness, there can be progressive permanent loss of strength. Most often this happens in the legs. People have difficulty walking upstairs, getting up out of a chair, and can even in some instances uh, cause loss of ambulation. So understandably, this is a, a great cause of concern. And it's something that uh, we're really just learning about. Uh, for many years, it's been recognized that if you have an opportunity to do a muscle biopsy and look at the tissue here, it, it, it looks pretty torn up. There are big vacuoles and, and holes in the muscle that, that shouldn't be there. And um, what we really need to understand is, is, is where do they come from? This, this appearance led many neurologists and investigators um, early on to think this was always going to be irreversible and permanent. And while in some regards um, that's true, there have been uh, some examples where uh, some degree of reversibility has occurred. This happened when uh, Professor Lehman Horn was exploring uh, some of the benefits of the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor drugs. So these drugs can affect uh, the distribution of, of water in and out of, of muscle. And he was using the MRI scanner to look at muscle swelling as a way to try to predict whether a patient with periodic paralysis was, was gonna get into trouble and have this permanent weakness. And these medications, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, uh, have primarily been used to prevent the brief attacks of weakness. They were not designed at the outset to prevent the permanent weakness. So he's doing his study, he's looking at this swelling, these shifts of water uh, with the MRI scanner with Dr. Weber as well. And, and what happened is an individual who um, had been wheelchair bound for years, uh, when given this medication to see if it impacted the, the water distribution in her, in her affected muscles, she regained a lot of strength and was able to get up and walk. So it's raised an open question of just how permanent is the permanent weakness that comes after many years of periodic paralysis. Again, it's anybody's guess at this point. I think it's a combination of uh, some structural damage that is indeed um, irreparable and permanent, but um, it's clear there can be uh, functional changes in the muscle that are prolonged. They last weeks or months, but there is some degree of reversibility. You know, there's great variability in the frequency and severity of the temporary attacks, the transient attacks. So if I happen to have frequent severe ones, am I more likely to have the permanent weakness than someone who only has mild attacks? And amazingly, the correlation isn't there. So there's an interesting gender difference. So in one of the most common forms of periodic paralysis, in some families, the women do not have substantial transient temporary uh, episodes. And yet, when they get to be 40, 50 years old, the permanent weakness creeps up and comes in. So there can be a dissociation between the brief attacks, which we know a lot about the science, and the late permanent weakness that we're still trying to figure out. That said, um, just about every physician, myself included, would say you should do everything you can to minimize the frequency and severity of your transient attacks. That we know when those occur, uh, the muscle is really struggling, there are major electrical problems, there's swelling that's happening, and that you should minimize the number and severity of those episodes to try to preserve muscle function. It's an interesting question because it, it leads people to ask, well, should I curtail my physical activity? Should I push more aggressively on taking medication to 
uh, minimize these uh, you know, transient attacks? Possibly, but we don't, we don't have strong data to make that kind of uh, definitive statement yet. Unfortunately, these are not easy questions to address either with laboratory-based animal models or following cohorts of individuals because it's a very slow process and takes years. Uh, that doesn't mean it isn't worth doing it or that we shouldn't or that uh, it, we won't get into this area, but it just makes it even more difficult. And it, it's why um, progress has been lagging in understanding this permanent muscle weakness. Where does it come from? What can we do about it? Uh, as contrasted with those brief transient attacks of loss of force. With regard to the permanent muscle weakness and what could someone do to minimize the risk of developing this late complication, we don't have direct uh, medical evidence on specific measures, but it does make complete sense to live as healthy a lifestyle as you can, to try to minimize the frequency and severity of your attacks. And you're the best person to understand what that involves. And it's important that your family, your employers, and your friends understand that you as an individual know better than anyone else, better than the scientists, better than the doctors, what your triggers are, what helps you feel good, and what enables you to maintain normal muscle strength. And you should follow those plans and make sure those around you understand this is important to you and support you in your choices because this is likely to have a long-term uh, influence on your outcome years from now and we all want to be proactive and do as much as we can uh, to remain active and healthy for years to come. If you would like to know more about periodic paralysis, visit periodicparalysis.org. And if you enjoyed this video and want more, hit that like button, subscribe to our channel and hit that bell so you don't miss any future videos. It really does help spread the word. You can view other videos about periodic paralysis by clicking the thumbnails to the right. If you have questions, just leave a comment below or reach out to us on social media. We'd love to hear from you.